Hello everyone. I am Dr. Shantanu Gupta, junior resident from Tokyola National Medical College and Vivail Nair Charitable Hospital, Mumbai. Today I am going to present a paper on role of MRI in positive mosaic malformations along with my co-author, Dr. Manisha Joshi, assistant professor, and under the guidance of Dr. Dev Shetty, professor in HOD. Congenetic positive mosaic malformations can result from genetic or disruptive mechanism. Genetic mutations causing malformations make a de novo or can be inherited from the parents. Evaluation of positive mosaic malformation with significant advances in neuroimaging techniques, both pre and postnatal, have enabled better definition and classification of the same. Here we shall demonstrate few cases in the spectrum of positive mosaic malformation where correct differential diagnosis played a paramount importance, not only for clinical follow up and prognosis of patient, but also to appropriately counsel the families for inheritance. Thus, for each disorder, we shall emphasize on key neuroimaging findings that were needed for a diagnosis. The aim of this study is to evaluate the role of MRI in detecting positive mosaic malformation. The study was conducted in the Department of Radio Diagnosis, TNMC Mumbai. The study was carried out using MR Flex Achiever Scanner, which possesses a superconducting magnet of 1.5 Tesla strength. The study included sample size from people of pediatric age group who represented developmental delay, neurological symptoms like difficulty swallowing, balance problems, abnormal eye movements, and cranial nerve abnormalities. And diagnosis was based made on typical MRI appearances, location, and associated features. The first case is of a one-month-old female infant born of consanguineous marriage. The child presented with complaints of inability to suck milk since birth, multiple episodes of GTCS, poor response to second gag reflexes, suggestive of parent abduction. The patient died after two months after multiple episodes of aspiration pneumonia. On MRI imaging, T2 axial images reveal molar tooth like appearance, and T1 inversion recovery images reveal hyperplastic middle cerebellar pit uncle. The mid sagittal T1 images reveal uh, flattening of ventral pons, along with narrowing of dorsal ventral mesons swelling stomas and dorsal pontile tegmental cap. DTI images reveal ectopic pontine transverse fibers as shown with standard diffusion tensor imaging. DTI superimposed color-coded fractional anisotropy images showed tegmental cap bundles of transversely oriented fibers representing ectopic pontine transverse fiber. The imaging features of the molar tooth-like configuration of quantum mesencephalic junction, dorsal pontine tegmental cap, and presence of ectopic transverse pontine fibers well demonstrated on DTI enabled accurate diagnosis of pontine tegmental cap dysplasia. ETCD. Now, what is the difference between JS, Jogart syndrome related disorder, and PTCD? Genetically, PTCD genetic basis is yet to be determined, while JSID is autosomally recessive. Molar tooth sign can be seen in both. Content tegmental cap is not seen in JSID, but can be seen in PTCD always. Clinical features include of JSID, retinopathy, congenitopathic fibrosis, and polydactyly. PTCD can uh, present as multiple cranial neuropathies, vertebral and rib anomalies. Prognosis of GSID varies based on multi organ involvement. In PTCD, cranial lung palsy is usually improved with age. However, death occurs due to aspiration pneumonitis as early as one month. The second case is of a four year old female child presenting with hypotonia, post facial features, global developmental delay, and extra pyramidal features. MR imaging revealed on T2 axial images thin and elongated posterior cerebellar peduncle with deep in interpeduncular fossa. On T1 inversion recovery, we could see subcortical white matter showing multiple discrete areas of gray matter and nodular areas in periventricular areas as gray matter heterotopy. Diffusion tensor imaging showed horizontal orientation of superior cerebellar peduncle. Our diagnosis was Jovert syndrome, also known as women hypoplasia or molar tooth in midbrain hindbrain malformation. The following case had been detected during routine ultrasound anomaly scan and was sent for fetal MRI for further evaluation. Fetal MRI showed large interhemispheric cyst and vermin aplasia with prominent posterior interpeduncular fossa. After birth, the child was brought for follow up scan. 
which showed vermin aplasia leading to stressed appearance of superior cerebral peduncle, giving a more tooth like appearance. There was also cystic dilatation of fourth ventricle extending posteriorly, along with occipital meningosus. There was also well defined large unilocular anterior interhemispheric cyst, along with polymicrovaria and right ventral cortex. Our diagnosis was dentibular continuum with Jobert syndrome. Signs and symptoms of the same include peak muscle tone, abnormal breathing patterns, abnormal eye movement, ataxia. Dysplasia and, and heteropia are common. The following case was a seven month old male presenting a depressed gag reflex, involuntary rapid downward eye movement with loss of consciousness and swelling in lower back. A USG of swelling revealed a myelomeningosy. On MR imaging, T1 cell image showed descent of cerebellar tonsil in the cervical canal and effacement of retrocerebellar CSS. Lumbar spine sequences showed a spinal defect with associated myelomeningosy. Our diagnosis was I don't carry type 2 malformation, which is characterized by myelomeningosy, a small posterior fossa with descent of brain stem, cerebellar tonsil, and vermis through foramen magnum. Imaging differentials include spinal astrocytoma, carry one malformation. The next case is an 11-year-old female who came with complaint of headache and fever since four days. She had been experiencing aggravating neck pain during exercise for two years. Even Sergi Mary showed peg like cerebellar tonsillar herniation, along with crowding of foramen magnum and effacement of premedullary and cerebellar medullary systems was noted. Cervical spine MRI showed long segment syrinx in spinal cord extending from lower level of C2 to lower level of D2, along with retroflexion of dense and shortening of climbers. There was also fusion of C1 and C2 vertebrae in the posterior spine. Our diagnosis was anode carried malformation 1.5. Since cerebellar tonsil descent was 9 mm and descent of OPEX was noted by 4 mm below the level of Raven magnum. They were also associated syringomyelia and bony abnormalities. In conclusion, we can say the neuroimaging yields detailed anatomic findings and plays a key role in diagnosis of congenital positive bosom malformation. Thus far, prenatal diagnosis of Jowar syndrome had, has proven difficult because of relatively non specific prenatal ultrasound findings reported in most affected fetuses. A further limitation of prenatal ultrasound is the difficulty in obtaining sagittal views due to fetal orientation. Advantages of MRI over ultrasound include superior tissue discrimination and resolution, elimination of ultrasound artifacts, and ability to achieve multiple planes of imaging, including sagittal views, regardless of fetal position. A developing carrier can limit ultrasound visualization of the brain, but does not hinder visualization by MRI. Diffusion tensor imaging is a promising method for characterizing microstructural changes or differences with neuropathology. Overall, TTI enhances the ability to diagnose PTCD by providing detailed information about microstructure of white matter tracts in the brain, allowing for better visualization and characterization of abnormalities such as those in PTCD. These are my references. Thank you.